Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the final Wild Card Wednesday episode before the launch of Season 2 of the Community Made Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Gaynard, broadcasting from my basement, also known as my in-home studio. And I need to apologize in advance if my voice is coming off a little raspy. I actually heated up a uh, beautiful cup of tea to my right here. Uh, However, one thing you'll know about me is there's no gray area. It's either black or white, and if I need to heat up water, I will heat it up to beyond boiling if possible, and the end result is that uh, it's scorching hot. I can't even hold the cup, and it'll probably be a good 80 to 90 minutes before I can do that. With that said, really, really excited for season two of the podcast. It is a monster of a season with over 20 episodes geared towards helping you grow, nurture, and amplify your business relationships. Topics in this season include how to network at events as an introvert, why the wisest investment is wisdom and how to find a mentor, how to reach the unreachable and befriend celebrities and billionaires, and how to benefit from being a catalyst by hosting dinners and other experiences. Again, this is a big season. Over half the episodes are solo episodes, with the other half of the episodes being interviews with friends of mine where I had to hop on a plane and fly to their city, if not fly to their country, to facilitate those interviews, and they came out fantastic. In today's episode, it's a little bit of a a teaser, I guess you could say, for season two. I recently did an interview with a very good friend of mine named Andrew who owns a company and a podcast called E-Commerce Fuel. He's been podcasting for a long time, and this interview turned out fantastic. I've been easily interviewed dozens of times over the years, and 99% of the time, an interview always goes through the same, I guess, structure. It starts with, you know, tell us your story, and, you know, how did you first become an entrepreneur, and what did that business look like, and those kind of things. And next thing you know, you're in... 45 minutes in, and you've yet to touch on anything that's actionable. And Andrew had a very different approach. He wasted no time whatsoever. He came right out of the gate asking really tough questions, which honestly caught me off guard initially, and you may get that uh, from the interview. So I thought there was no better way to introduce a lot of the concepts from season two than to actually share this interview with you. So in this episode, we cover how to connect with influencers like Seth Godin or Kevin Rose, knowing when to leverage your network, the rules for facilitating introductions, and why how you do anything is how you do everything and so much more. Ladies and gentlemen, hopefully you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. Enjoy this intimate one-on-one with Andrew from E-Commerce Fuel. So let's say, for example, you want to try to get to know someone high profile for, you know, it could be any reason. Let's say Kevin Rose, someone I just kind of pulled out of thin air. Assuming you don't know Kevin Rose, which if you do, maybe you can tell me we could pick someone else. But assuming you don't, how would you approach getting getting to know him? And just so if people don't know Kevin Rose, he founded Reddit. He's I think he's a partner with Google Ventures. Cool, interesting guy in the tech space. So what would be kind of your approach, your game plan for trying to, to get build a relationship with him? Yeah, so I, I think a couple things. One is whenever I have anybody that wants to connect with a big name, I always ask, would you be friends with you? Meaning if you want to connect with a millionaire or a tech titan in this case, what would make you fascinating to that individual? And it doesn't have to be apples to apples. Like if you want to connect with somebody who's well off financially, you don't have to be well off financially, but you have to be interesting or fascinating on some level. So for example, I have a friend of mine who's traveled to 119 different countries. He can sit at a table with almost anybody and hold a great conversation because he's he's fascinating. So that's the kind of the the first thing is really like one thing I've always done a pretty good job at is we do balance sheets for our business, our assets, our liabilities, those kind of things. But I've kind of shifted that and and have done like personal balance sheets. What am I really good at? What are my strengths? What are my areas that I can improve upon? What are my weaknesses? And again, I'm always looking to, to be more interesting. I think that's, that's kind of the, the first point because before you reach out to anybody, even in a mentor mentee capacity, you have to be somebody worth investing in as far as a, just the relationship and time. Would you be friends with you is, is the first thing. The second thing is have a strong why, 
I think this is a mistake a lot of people make, and I've made this mistake as well, is that we want to connect with people. Picking their brain is a strong why, right? Just for the record. <laughs> well, that's exactly it. So didn't mean to pick on that specifically, but I get asked for introductions all the time. When people ask for introductions, I always use, I wouldn't question it. I would just facilitate the introduction. And then I would see the follow-up email that they do, and I'm like, oh, this was a terrible idea. So instead now I'm like, well, just give me a desire. Like, what's a desired outcome for the introduction? And 90% of the time, they won't follow up. The need for the introduction will just die. So having a clear and strong why for an introduction or why for a reason to reach out to a certain individual, I think is really, really important. And those are two things that people don't talk about. And I think that's much more important than the technical like how-to. With that said, if you are interesting on some level, and you do have a strong why, then different ways you can go about it. One of the easiest ways, not easiest, but best ways and most effective ways is through a warm introduction. So ideally, try to find somebody that you are mutually kind of connected with who can facilitate that introduction. If not, then you may have to reach out cold. There's a bunch of different ways you can figure out people's email addresses. There's a lot of great blog posts out there on how to do it. So I won't I'll spare you the details, but in that cold outreach, there's a saying from a great book called 22 Immutable Laws of Marketing, which is what works in the military works in marketing, and that's the unexpected. And I think the same can be said when it comes to trying to build relationships with people. You know, somebody like Kevin Rose may get 500 emails a day. So if you're going to send them another email, how can you make that email pop or stand out? So it could be an emoji in the title. I use video emails a lot. So I'll use a platform like Viewedit, V I E W. E-D-I-T. I feel like I'm in a spelling bee. And you can basically record a video email and that stands out. And in that email, usually what I do is I'd say, I'd have a text version and I would have a video version, but ultimately I would try to see if I can connect with them on some level, whether it be an uncommon commonality. So Kevin Rose is big into tech. So see, you know, you can leverage that uncommon commonality that you guys share. Or we always, like all of us have a deep desire to for significance and praise and and those kind of things. So if you're going to praise somebody and use that in your outreach, don't just say, oh, hey, I love your work and leave it there. Like be very specific. The more specific you can be, the, the better. And that may just buy you enough time to catch their interest to read the rest of the email. But to me, again, would you be friends with you? Have a strong why are, are two really big components and plant a seed. Meaning, you know, if you want to connect with Kevin Rose, better to try to plant that seed now than two years down the road when you really want to connect with them. And I'll give you an example. I know Tim Ferriss, for example. I met him initially in 2011. It wasn't until I saw him five or six times in person that we really struck up a, a, a like a decent conversation. So again, don't be don't be scared to plant that seed. If you have a an author that you love his work, send him an uh, email or a tweet and say, you know, love your work and here's the reason why or or those kind of things. You never want to ideally you never want to start an outreach with an ask. What about so maybe we can go hypothetical to more specific you on your podcast you had Seth Godin on your on your show so how did you how were you able to he's he's a guy that's obviously in, in huge demand for speaking and and I, I don't think he does a ton of interviews especially uh, so, so how did you use those principles to to get him on the show so Seth Seth is a unique example in the sense that he's uh, him and Gary V in the business <laughs> in the circle and business environment are probably the most accessible guys in the sense that they read their own email so they don't have gatekeepers. They they really strive. I know them both personally now, but they both strive to like reply to all the emails and those kind of things. I remember my my interaction with Seth. How it happened was basically I went to an event that he facilitated and uh, got huge value from it. Took action on a lot of things that he shared, and then followed up with him months later telling him, well, this is what I learned from you. This is how I took action. These are the re results I got and would love to interview you for the podcast. He said, that sounds fantastic, but I'm, I don't know if he said he was busy at the moment, but basically I was very early on with the podcast. And I guess there's a lot of people in the podcasting space. It's very sexy right now to start a podcast and not too many people are veterans like you that have been kind of doing it for a long time. So oftentimes the, those big name people want to see that you can actually stick with the consistency of doing a podcast. So I think at the time I was only at a couple episodes. He said, well, let me know, you know, how you're doing in a six months or a year. So I followed up afterwards, I think probably six months or a year later and said like, you know, I've been still at it. Love to know if you want to get on the show, hear some of the past guests and those kind of things. But I think I opened that with somewhat like 
praise and, and again, significance in the sense that like I took what he said, I took action on it, I got a result and I followed up with him. So I kind of closed that loop because oftentimes as, as people who are thought leaders, you know, they write a book, they spend a year or two years writing this book, they put it out to the world, they don't necessarily know how it's received or what is taken from it, what's what people take action on. And to me as an author, when I have people reach out to me because I wrote a book called Mastermind Dinners and they take action and, and do a dinner themselves and they send me a photo, I mean, I will make time for that person because that's like the greatest expression of myself is, is, is that book ultimately. So yeah, Seth Godin is a, a unique case, but that's how that happened. How do you decide what new intros to take? One of the things about networking is, especially, I feel like today in like 2017, you get to a certain point and you have a lot of inbound requests or people asking for your time to either help them or to connect with somebody interesting. But there's a balance between taking intros and always kind of exploring serendipitous leads and relationships and being focused on cultivating the network that you have, on executing on what you need to get done. How do you find that balance? How do you decide when to take intros and when to, you know, kind of very respectfully decline? Yeah. So it's, it's, it's more of an art than a science. I mean, at, at the the phase that I'm at, which is I have an abundance of, of friends and connections and contacts. For me, the key to a strong network is subtraction and not addition. It's one of those things that if I say yes to somebody who is maybe like a, a B player or a C player, let's say, I'm saying no to somebody that's a relationship that I need to invest in ultimately. So, and when I say B player, C player, it doesn't, has, has nothing to do with success, but just really like the quality of a relationship. So yeah, I mean, there's something called the Dunbar number, which is the, the amount of stable social relationships that we can have, which is 150. So I try to be very conscious as far as who I spend my time with. I look at my network almost like the Spartans. It used to be said that one Spartan was worth several men in another state. So I'm always looking for opportunities to refine who I spend my time with and, you know, weed out people if need be. So uh, as far as, but it's, again, it's a fine balance because when it comes to introductions, it depends how it comes. Cause I'm a firm believer that amazing people know other amazing people. That's how my network grows at this point in time. It's, it's generally through introductions. And if somebody I know and trust says, Hey, I have somebody that uh, I want to connect you with. I almost always take that introduction even if I don't know it's necessarily a great introduction, I don't turn it down because I never want them to second guess doing introductions in the future. Because, you know, who knows, out of five or 10 introductions, one of them may be a life changer for me. So I always say yes to, to those introductions, or at least I try to. When somebody reaches out to me cold, again, I always, it, it kind of ties into what we talked about earlier. I mean, it really depends on, on how they reach out and, you know, I guess how promising they are as far as like, if I do give them feedback, will they take action on it and those kind of things. But it's one of the, a lot of people don't invest in relationships because they can't peg an ROI to it. But Steve Jobs once said, you can't connect the dots looking forward. You just need to trust that they'll somehow connect. And the last thing I would ever want to do is kind of burn bridges or any of that kind of stuff. Because I've seen people, amazing people become increasingly amazing over time. And for me to be able to invest in somebody like you would invest in a business, find somebody who's undervalued and you know, support them, believe in them, offer them guidance and advice. You know, five years down the road, that could be the next Tim Ferriss or 20 years down the road, that could be the next Elon Musk. You never know. It's a fine balance of, of managing your time and, and trying to kind of help everybody. But again, it's to me, the key to a strong network is subtraction and not addition. You mentioned introductions. You know, what are some good rules for making good introductions for being a facilitator there? I think one of the most obvious ones is double opt in, making sure that that both people are interested in the introduction, so you don't blind some blindside somebody with with an intro that they don't necessarily you know is is not a good fit for them or, or they're busy. What other rules or maybe concepts do you have for making you know introductions where both people are really excited about? Is is it primarily just about thinking through the value that both side is is going to receive and making sure it's a reciprocal relationship potentially? Yeah. Well, you touched on, I think, the most important factor that's unfortunately not obvious, the importance of a double opt-in introduction. Again, it's I, I mean, I'm always blown away how many times I just get a random introduction in my inbox. And I'm historically not great at, at answering email in a timely fashion. And because of that, when I get a random introduction, it puts the onus on me to drop everything to reply back to that person as quickly as possible. Not only to be nice to that person that is being introduced to me, but also to be respectful of the person who made the introduction, because I don't want to make them look silly either. So double introductions are, are huge. And I think, again, vetting the, the individual who wants the introduction, if they ask for it, 
as far as what their desired outcome is and why they want to connect with that person, I think helps them get their house in order so that when you make the introduction, it's not like, hey, I just want to connect with you because I think you're interesting or something like that. So I don't, I definitely don't want to glance over the importance of a double opt-in introduction. And yeah, I mean, if it's, it depends on 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 the context. If it is some, somebody reaching out because they want to connect to a certain individual, when I do do that double opt-in and I reach out to the other individual and say, hey, you know, this is who I want to connect you with. I also don't, I give them an, a, an escape in the sense that like, I don't make it, I say like, like there's no pressure expectations for this introduction. If you have no desire to connect with this person or you see no value, then please like, just let me know. And I can easily do the dirty work and say, you know, he, he's busy right now or those kind of things. Cause some people still do double opt in intros with me, but it's so hard to say, no, there's no out. So I think that's an important factor. The vetting is, is an important factor. And then facilitating the introduction itself, giving context. I see so many people make that mistake is that I'll get this introduction. I'll say, you know, Hey, Joe, meet James. I really think you two will hit it off. Then I've actually hopped on a call with these people where there's a there's poor context for an introduction and neither of us know why we're on the call. So setting the tone is saying like, hey, you know, James, I want you to meet John. John is a phenomenal entrepreneur, XYZ. This is, you know, he's brilliant at this. And this is why I thought I'd introduce you and 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 vice versa. And also it's a great opportunity to stroke the egos of of both individuals and say, listen, I'm a huge and it, you know, if it comes from a genuine place that you love this person and you, or you respect them for for these reasons, it's just another opportunity to invest in those relationships. So those are are some ways to kind of go above and beyond when it comes to introduction. Seth Godin, he wrote a book called Tribes and you know, partially on the importance of being a connector and you're kind of in that place to, you know, you know, a lot of different people kind of built a a career on that at this point. Where do you see the biggest value in being a connector? I mean, you could kind of play devil's advocate and argue on the other side that being that connector or that spoke, you connect a lot of other people, but you know, you yourself may not get the value. You're just the conduit through which people, you know, connect. And, and what are your thoughts on that? Like, where do you see in the end game, the long-term game, you being, you know, receiving value by connecting people the right way? Yeah, I mean, it's tough because people look at uh, the work that I do, the value that is created from it, and they think that I should try to monetize those said relationships. So if I introduce two people and they start doing business together, I should get a cut. And I know some people that kind of approach business and life that way. But for me, it just makes things transactional and makes things sticky. So I don't do that. And I could be missing out on, again, a financial ROI. But you know, based on kind of where I've been, I've understood the importance of relationships and how that has kind of showed up for me. You know, when you hit rock bottom in life, and we all do, there's two things that at least became clear to me back in 2012. One was, you never know the value of your relationships until you really need it. And the second thing is the integrity of your word and never tarnish your word and always invest in your relationships. So to me, again, people don't invest in relationships because they can't pick an ROI. I've been investing, I've been doubling down on relationships for the last four years. I've never felt more fulfilled. I've never been in a better financial position. It's uh, to me, it's the safest and wisest investment you can make. What about when it comes times to, to leverage your network? And that leverage is maybe a bad, I mean, that's a, a loaded term. It sounds very ominous, like you're sucking the life out of people. But do you think people do it enough? Do you think they do it too much? Should you come with a philosophy of building a network for a specific reason? Or do you think that you should just build it to have, because you don't know, obviously it's nice to have, you don't know what's going to happen. So it's, it's nice to have there as an insurance policy. But, but what are some of the ways that you think through, you know, tactfully leveraging that, that network when the time is right? Yeah, it's two-sided. I mean, I, um, historically myself, I've been guilty of building out a, a great network, but not asking for help when I need it. So I think that's, that's again, a lot of us fall into that category where we build out all these great relationships, but have a hard time asking for help. So I think asking for help is, is the other side of the equation that a lot of us kind of miss. And to me, it's baffling how many times I'm struggling with something and struggling and struggling. And then I look at my, you know, my peer group and I'm like, this guy has the answer. Why did I not reach out to him to begin with? So it's a fine kind of balance. It's a, it's a, it's a fine dance. As far as like, the term leverage, yeah, I mean, it, it does have an icky feeling to it, but I totally understand why you just kind of position it as such. To me, I like my philosophy is just almost give till it hurts. I don't invest in relationships for the sake of reciprocity, but I never want to almost look at it like a bank account. Like I'm investing in relationships, investing in my relationships. I never want to be in a position where, you know, I ask for something and it puts that relationship in overdraft. 
So, yeah, I, I, I mean, I have people that I've invested in for last or relationships I've invested in for the last four or five years and I haven't asked anything and it drives them nuts from a reciprocity perspective. They're like, please, like, let me do something for you. I just, I got to get better personally at asking myself. So that's a, a personal kind of challenge I'm, I'm trying to overcome. What kind of details do you read into that maybe other people don't? And maybe, maybe a, a broader question on that is, do you read into small details? So for example, if you sit down with somebody that you're thinking about, you know, potentially investing more in or getting to know better, what kind of things that are seemingly inconsequential do you think kind of speak to larger character traits or tell you something meaningful about a person that some people might not think are no big deal? Yeah. I mean, I fundamentally believe how you do anything is how you do everything. So I'm always looking for those small little quirks in their behaviors or personalities. So, you know, if you're out for at a restaurant, how they treat the server or those kind of things or how they talk about other individuals. You know, I had, for example, a really close mentor kind of friend of mine have a business fallout and he's been friends. I've been friends with him for 10 years and I was not a hundred percent on board with how he treated that relationship upon the exit. And I'm like, if it happened to his business partner, it can happen to me or it can happen to somebody I know. So I distance myself from, from that individual. So I'm always looking for these very small cues that again, some people would glance over, but how somebody treats somebody in their personal life is how they'll treat them in business or in a business partnership and vice versa. So I'm always looking for the small little cues of lack of integrity or ego and those kind of things. What about things that people do to sabotage their own networking? I mean, I can think of kind of a real obvious one. If you're at if you're at some kind of event and somebody comes up and within 15 seconds they've shoved a business card in your face, that tends to be a pretty bad sign. That was you know 99 percent of the time that that card just gets tossed out and you send a pretty bad signal right out of the bat. Any other things like that that you think people are in inadvertently doing to sabotage themselves connecting with people meaningfully? I think that again, I think it's the, the transactional side of things. I mean, a lot of the gospel in the networking space is very again transactional the, the word networking like some of the synonyms are like hobnobbing and those kind of things not, not you know nothing i want to be associated with so again looking at a relationship from an roi perspective right out of the gate that you want to ask for something i mean people are not st- stupid you know i mean like like we generally have a pretty good internal kind of compass and radar when it comes to somebody wanting something from us so i think that's where people miss the mark when they think of the term networking which is a term i'm not obviously a fan of but i haven't come up with a better term (laughs) it's just again very transactional the reason you're doing it is to to further yourself or further your business at the expense of others oftentimes and that takes the form of again shoving business cards in people's faces and you know uh, unnecessary kind of follow-up and those kind of things what about what about the importance of small details things like personal details birthdays interests family you know people's backgrounds it's you know you're trying to get to know people these things they do matter but also they're easy to forget so like i guess what i'm asking is how much do you do you think about those do you do you do you write them down if you do write them down do you keep them like in a crm does that seem a little bit once you get to that stage does that seem like that's almost too like robotic and mechanical and at that point you're not necessarily being really relational you're just you know kind of getting back to that more synthetic fake relationship building how do you think about how the small details tie into building genuine relationships and and you know how far you take that i'm glad you brought it up it's absolutely crucial you know for me I have something called the biggest fan philosophy, which is how somebody would look at investing in a business. I look at investing in people. So somebody tries to find an undervalued business and invest in it. I try to find people who are undervalued diamonds in the rough, so to speak, and invest in them. And that doesn't have to be financially. It could be with time. It could be with a connection. It could be with just belief, right? I think as entrepreneurs, anybody in general, we all can think of a time when somebody believed in us when we didn't necessarily believe in ourselves and the impact that necessarily that, that had on us. So for me, I'm always looking for those little things. And in the context of like these things that are unique to them, whether it be the name of their kids or where they grew up or what excites them. I mean, that's when you really start to build a, a, a deep relationship, relationship with somebody. So I capture as much of that as I can, whether that be over email. If somebody says, oh, you know, I had, um, sorry, I'm late. I had to put my kid to sleep. I'll be like, oh, what's the name of your, your child or how old is your child or those kind of things. And I'll capture that. Or if I'm in conversation at lunch or something like that, I'll 
I'll ask and I'll dig for things and it's genuine interest. It's not from me trying to extract things, but genuine interest. And I'll pay attention to the things that, that matter to them. And after a conversation, I'll either, or after a lunch, I'll, I'll either write things in a notebook or I'll do an audio recording and I'll save it. And then that will go into a CRM that I use. And it's just one of those things I did a lunch today where I have all these important points, like the name of his, his wife and you know what keeps him up at night and what he's working on and those kind of things. These are all just great starting points for our next conversation. And I can tell you, man, I went to an event in 2011. I remember meeting one guy named Mike and his daughter was three months old and she was born blind, but she was getting better over time. And I still remember that. And six months later, I followed up and I'm like, oh, how's your daughter? And it had nothing to do with business whatsoever, but it was something that mattered immensely to him. And if it mattered, if I will, there's a saying by um, Tony Robbins that if you want to influence somebody, find out what or who already influences them. And I take that if you want to care about somebody, care about who they care about or care about what they care about. So I try to capture all of those things. So, you know, obviously somebody cares about their daughter who's three months old. So that's a talking point for me or, you know, what they're passionate about, whether it be a sport or, or, or whatever the case, those are all unique points that deepen the relationship far faster than, you know, oh, how's business or how's the weather and those kind of things. So that crucial component to building deep, genuine relationships. And the only reason you put in a CRM is truth be told, we live in a time that we're absolutely overwhelmed. So to be able to create these kind of databases of important quirks and facts and dates and names and those kind of things pertaining to certain individuals, I think is, is priceless. And is, it's a best practice that I've been doing for the last couple of years. What do you think about the state kind of more broadly, maybe away from, from networking for business to just, just re- people's relationships and community in general? What do you think about the state of community today? I'll just say in North America, it's Various throughout the world, but you know, North America. Uh, just just to give us a, a framework, there's an interesting book I read. Uh, I'll link up to it called Tribe about kind of how so much of society today is less focused on community than it was even 50 or 100 years ago, and and uh, people have fewer and fewer you know close friends. I mean, you know, kind of generalizing a little bit here, but have you seen that? Like, do you feel like that's a systemic problem with a lot of our society today, or do you think that's overblown? Yeah. So Tribe by Sebastian Junger is one of my favorite books of all time by far. It's an absolutely brilliant book. And we, I think social isolation is a epidemic. You know, we see it everywhere. I mean, in, in Sebastian's book, he talks about PTSD in the military and those kind of things. There's a, even bringing it back to, to business a little bit. A Weber partnered up with Copyblogger a few years ago, and they discovered that there was one email title that opened had super high open rates across industries. It worked for personal development. It worked for potty training. It worked for Viagra. It worked for selling cars. And that email subject line was, you are not alone. And I think it's, it's telling. I mean, there's a book called Never Eat Alone by Keith Ferrazzi. He wrote another book called Who's Got Your Back? And in that book, he interviewed a thousand people and asked them one question and one question only, who has your back? And surprisingly, 55% of people felt like nobody had their back. Even more surprisingly, 60% of the people who felt like nobody had their back were married. So I think we are in a time where on a surface level, we feel like we are more connected than ever, but we've never felt more isolated and it's showing up everywhere. It's showing up in uh, the depression rates, suicide rates, especially amongst young, I guess, professionals who are young kids that have grown up on social media. I mean, the the suicide rates are just going through the roof. It shows up in different, there was a TED talk on the, it was a 76 year, it's still going on. It's like a 76 year study on adult development. And basically they found out the biggest predicator for longevity wasn't your diet, wasn't uh, your exercise, but actually the your social ties and how tight your social ties were. So I think so it's not only like the, the business component where you'll benefit from having tight relationships and that kind of stuff, but also mental health, physical health, longevity, overall happiness, like all of these t- things are tied to relationships. And again, it's, it's one of those things I think we're, we're drowning in connections, but we're starving for community. We see it time and time again, and I don't think it's going to get any better, unfortunately. So I think, you know, having a community, whether it be joining a community like, like yours or, creating a community of your own of like-minded individuals and peers, I think is absolutely priceless. And kind of tying into the, the importance of, of community being in person, Mastermind Talks is kind of a, kind of one of the keystone events you've, or the keystone event you've, you've, you've really uh, built up over the last few years. Can you give people a sense who haven't heard of it, what Mastermind Talks are and what you do differently to make it really unique from other events? 
I got to say, that was a beautiful segue. I'm very impressed. Yeah, I mean, so, so Mastermind Talks initially was just a fun project, but I always say that ignorance, hard work, and confidence can go a long way sometimes, and I didn't know what I was doing, and because of that, it turned out to be a big success. And they, I mean, it's been an evolution. I mean, our first event was geared towards wanting to be almost like the TED Talks for entrepreneurs. So it was very kind of content heavy. But because the the attendees were so curated, there started to be that this this community that that formed. And when we had our first event, we had 15 speakers, 10 of them came back as paid attendees the following year. So every year we've kind of evolved and leaned more into the whole kind of peer to peer model. And if you know, we just finished our last event in Carmel in May, and our next one is in September of 2018. If I could boil down the essence to anything, Mastermind Talks, it's, it's great people, great food, great experiences in a beautiful setting with learning intertwined throughout the event. Because my belief is the best learning doesn't happen in a conference room. It happens at the bar or it happens over yoga and those kind of things. And also, you know, if you want to hear somebody like Tim Fair speak and, you know, he, he's a friend, he's brilliant, but to s- invest four or five days out of your calendar to sit down passively listening to a speaker speak to you when you can consume that content in a podcast or, you know, listening to a TED talk on the way to the gym, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. So we've really shifted from, we always say people may come to master my talks for content, but what brings them back year over year is community. So we are very, very focused on building that community and we do it through our three day live experience. And then we pull those relationships online throughout the year. So, you know, now, now that we've done five of these looking in the feedback forms, the most common and the most common words used are like community or family and those kind of things. A lot of people feel that this is almost like a family reunion for them, which is a beautiful thing. Like, so we have 150 people at, at our event or part of our community. I'd easily have 135 of them to my wedding. I mean, these are my favorite people on the planet. So yeah, it's 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 very much a, a community focus. I hate kind of lumping it in with events, but that's really where it kind of started. And that's somewhat still what it is with the 3D Lab experience. It's really just a, a beautiful community of people. Yeah, I, I love the the approach there. It's, it's kind of similar to what we do at, at e-commerce school for the for the events because events are a not impossible, but at least for us, I'll speak for us. There are especially for how much work goes into them. We do not do them to try to make money because that is a. It's just, I mean, our hourly rate would would be you know dollars if not negative. <laughs> so, but for us, it's about bringing the really building the community and bringing people together and solidifying what we we've you know, tried to start or at least catalyze online with relationships. And so it's cool you've done that as well. And we, we sat down in Toronto and you were kind enough to give me some, you know, really share with me a lot of what you guys do at your events, a couple of ideas of which I stole for this upcoming uh, ECF Live. So thank you. I really appreciate your your thoughts on that, man. No, I'm a huge fan of what you do. And I was, uh, as we kind of talked about offline, I, I came in and checked out your the meetup you had in Toronto and you had a phenomenal group of, of people there. And especially in the e-commerce space, when you, when you, especially entrepreneurs in general that, that play online mostly, again, they, they, they miss out on that face-to-face component. And it sounds like you're doing a beautiful job bridging the two. So honor the work that you do. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. It's, uh, it's, it's a lot of fun to do. Hey, in closing... Jason, I want to talk about your podcast, Community Made. Obviously, if people are listening to this, it's, it's something I think would interest them. And it's you're getting ready to release your second season. It's focused on relationships. Can you talk about what, you know, if people tune into that, what can they expect to hear? Well, basically, I've been somewhat positioned as like the master kind of networker, connector, that kind of stuff. And to me, it's, I haven't put that much value on it because it, it felt like it's, it's kind of come naturally. But I've really, uh, over the years, kind of, dissected the things that I do and and those kind of things. And basically I'm putting it all into season two of the podcast. So season two is all about how to grow your network. And that includes how to network at events as an introvert and just kind of grow your network in, in general, general, especially in today's day and age, how to nurture your network. And I think that's, again, something in, in, in our current kind of social fabric is, is important to do because we have a lot of connections, but again, not a lot of really deep connections at that. It's, there's a saying that it doesn't matter how many friends you can count, it, matter how, it matters how many friends you can count on. And I believe that to be true. So the importance of deepening those connections and then kind of amplifying. So the, whether that be building community and those kind of things. So season one was all about the notion of scale, where I talked about my views on scale and I had Gary Vaynerchuk on and a bunch of other people. And season two was all about relationships. And so I'm really excited about it. 
Love it. Yeah. Communitymade.com. I'll link up to it and I'll be listening to it when it comes out. When does that, when does that kind of uh, season two hit? That'll be mid January, 2018. Perfect. Just in time to gear up networking 2018. Exactly. Yeah. That, that's why we timed it that almost way. Almost intentional. It sounds like Jason, one last thing I want to do in closing here. If you're up for it is do a lightning round to you. Is that, that cool with you? Yeah. All right. So first question, if you had to identify the number one thing you're trying to optimize your life for right now, what would it be? Personal time. Who's someone you strongly disagree with? Oh, geez. My wife. <laughs> um, I try to think. Grant Cardone. That's that's an individual. He's public. I'm not a huge fan of Grant Cardone. <laughs> and, and I'm not super familiar with him. What, if, maybe in one sentence, what is it his fundamental stance or what is, what is it that he stands for that you disagree with? I mean, he's well known in the entrepreneur space. Similar, I don't know if you're familiar with like Ty Lopez. I don't have anything against Ty Lopez. Uh, teaching people how to start businesses and, and those kind of things. Yeah, I mean, kind of the whole notion of building business at all costs and also just really, really not a fan of his marketing tactics. How much money is enough? What would be your number of money in the bank where you'd, you'd be able to say, this is, this is good, this is enough? I... Yeah, to me, it's almost like not a, a set number in the bank. As silly as it sounds, it's more like a consistent cash flow because I feel like if I have... X amount of money in the bank, I'll probably find a way to spend it as opposed to if I consistent cash flow, that'd be a little, little better. And it came out to me in chunks, but really probably, I mean, my monthly burn to live like a really great life is about 15,000 a month. So whatever that would be for the rest of my life is probably man, taking into account inflation is probably whatever that number comes out to. Okay. Nice. What's the worst investment you've made in the last 10 years? That's a tough one because even when you have bad investments, you try to justify it as a learning experience. We're all, as humans, we're meaning-seeking machines. So even if something was terrible, you're like, oh, well, there was a message in there. Uh, <laughs> so I'm going to have a hard time identifying. It, it's probably something around time because, I mean, financially, I could care less. Cause I mean, I've lost money in bad business partnerships and those kind of things. But to me, time is is obviously irreplaceable. So it probably revolves around time. I just can't put my finger on it right now. Uh, on the flip side of that, what's the best investment outside of your core business you've made in the last 10 years? Relationships. Uh, <laughs> Softball, baby. I just threw the one right up for you. There you go. Thank you. Yeah, no, I mean, absolutely. Without a shadow of a doubt, it's 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 relationships. It ties into, to I guess, my business on some level for sure. But even if I wasn't in this business, I would be doubling down on relationships all day long. And, and finally, what was the first CD you ever owned? <laughs> what a curveball. Softball, the curveball. Honestly, it wasn't, well, it wasn't a CD. Maybe I'm dating myself. It was a cassette. And it was Snoop Dogg <laughs> and NWA. Oh, uh, it's awesome. I love I love hearing the answers to those. Jason, man, well, this has been this has been a ton of fun. Thanks for coming on. And if you know if you didn't catch it the first time through, make sure at a minimum check out communitymade.com. That's where Jason's got his podcast and mastermind talks. We'll link up to that that website, mastermindtalks.com, if you're interested in learning more about the event. It has a really cool, really cool video that kind of highlights that. So if that's something you're, you're curious about or want to check out, I highly recommend it. Jason, it's been a lot of fun. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for all your help and support and advice you gave me in person in Toronto. And looking forward to, to catching up soon, man. Awesome, dude. I appreciate these well-thought-out questions. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, buddy. See you, brother. Ladies and gentlemen, this is it for this Wild Card Wednesday episode. It's been 20 plus minutes now, and I'm still staring at my hot cup of tea. I hope you enjoyed this one. I'm really, really excited, as you can tell, for season two of the podcast on how to grow, nurture, and amplify your business relationships. That is coming out in early April. If you want to know more from me or hear from me in the interim, because April seems like it's so far away. Join the Community Made group by simply visiting communitymade.com. In there, we give away free books. I recently gave away, I think, 15 copies of Gary Vee's newest book, Crushing It. I uh, also gave away Steve Sims' book, who's a good friend of mine, which is called Blue Fishing, which people loved. I also host special trainings in there and Q&As, usually about once a month. Plus, we just have a killer group of folks, and it's free. So no excuses. Communitymade.com. If you enjoyed this episode, nothing would make me happier than hearing your thoughts or biggest takeaways. Feel free to reach out to me on Twitter at Jason Gaynar, J-A-Y-S-O-N-G-A-I-G-N-A-R-D, or email me at Jason at Communitymade.com. If you enjoyed the podcast, I'd be forever grateful. If you got the word out by sharing it with a friend, rating it on iTunes, or leaving a review. With that said, I got to give a very special shout out to Heidi Taylor for leaving a review recently where she said, 
The holiday gift giving episode in season one saved me money and heartache as I was about to buy presents for my connections and heard what Jason had to say. I highly recommend you listen to this podcast. The conversations, insights, and value I received are impossible to quantify. So do yourself a favor and just hit subscribe. Heidi, you're a gem. Thank you so much. And I actually saw in the Facebook group that you received your copy of Gary's book, Crushing It. So thank you again for the honest review. Also, quick side note, our first workshop sold out. This was not necessarily (laughs) expected, but I'm hosting a workshop in the near future on a lot of the stuff that we talk about in season two of the podcast. That first workshop sold out within a day or two. So we're doing a second workshop. So to see dates and availability for those workshops on how to grow, nurture, and amplify your business relationships, they're two-day workshops, visit superconnectorworkshop.com. And again, superconnectorworkshop.com. For the rest of you out there who are listening, I appreciate the love and support and look forward to sharing season two with you soon. Enjoy your week.